The first question I'm going to get into is a question on optimal capital structure. What is the right amount of debt and equity? And to review, why do we care about the capital structure that a company has? So one analysis that is very common that you do in investment banking or any kind of fundamental analysis, if you're trying to value a business, is the discounted cash flow analysis. And that is literally nothing more than you project out the unlevered free cash flows a company is going to generate in the future, and you discount those cash flows back to today before adding them up. Now, the discount rate that we use is something called the WEC. So in a past Q&A, I answered a question someone asked, which was like, how does increasing debt impact the WAC? And essentially gave a very simplified explanation, walking through when you increase debt, it lowers the cost of capital up to a certain point, And then it sort of tips over into causing the cost of capital to go up. Yes, Jen. What does the WAC stand for again for uh, our yes. who may not remember? WAC is weighted average cost of capital. Thank so you. Again, that is a combination of the actual cost of capital, meaning cost of debt, cost of equity, and the weightings of each of them, right? What percentage of the business is funded with debt and what percentage of the business is funded with equity. So now if we just think theoretically, well, if you can lower your cost of capital, guess what? If you lower your discount rate from a valuation standpoint, it means that the value of the business should go up. So that's why, in theory, everyone should want the lowest cost of capital possible. Again, as part of that video, I made a probably relatively non-controversial statement, which was that debt is cheaper than equity. And again, there were some valid criticisms, um, but as I said, one that was a little surprising. So let's actually start with the first criticism, is, which was like, I didn't mention that the cost of debt is tax deductible. So that's something that just goes without saying. So for a U.S. company, you can deduct the interest that you pay on your debt. So therefore, if you're actually looking at what is the cost of debt, you take the cost of debt and multiply it by one minus the tax rate. So just to put some numbers around this. So if your cost of borrowing is 7%, right? You can go in the market, you can raise debt for a 7% interest rate and the tax rate of your company is 25%, then your after-tax cost of borrowing is that 7% times one minus 25% or five and a quarter. This, by the way, is the case up to a certain point. So prior to 2017, you could take tax deductions on any amount of interest. So, you know, in theory, your tax savings would only go away when the business stopped being profitable. If the company is not earning any money, they're not going to be paying those taxes. Now, as part of the 2017 tax bill, it limited the tax deductions that companies could take on their interest. So this phased in with time. So from basically 2018 to 2021, the limit was you could only deduct interest in the amount of up to 30% of EBITDA. And then in 2022, it dropped to 30% of EBIT. So just to give you some numbers, your EBITDA is always going to be higher than your EBIT, right? Because it is in earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. So if your EBITDA is 150 and your EBIT is 100 and you can only take 30%, well, previously you were able to take 30% of 150, 50? Yeah, <laughs> you were able to take $50 million of interest deductions. Now you can only take, call it $30 million of interest deductions. So as we get into higher rates, that potentially starts to be something that you think about, especially when you are doing a leverage buyout or even doing some of these cost of capital analyses. Okay, now that we've established that you get tax benefits with debt, I want to address now how does increasing debt impact the cost of capital? So it is worth noting that there are competing theories of capital structure out there. So the traditional theory says that there is in fact an optimal capital structure and the value can be created by changing the mix of debt and equity. There is also something called the pecking order theory, uh, which basically says that financing comes from three sources. You have the internal funds, so retained earnings, so the mm -hmm. money that you're actually generating yourself. You have debt, and then you have new equity. And that in general, companies should prioritize their financing, starting with the internal financing, then go into debt, and then lastly, raising equity as a last resort. The argument for this is that a company, if they issue new equity, investors believe that managers think that the company is overvalued and are taking advantage of this overvaluation. And this is something that I definitely saw in theory, like there is truth to that working in convert. So I, I will talk about that in a few minutes. And then there is the Madigliani and Miller theorem. Uh, these are two men, by the way, who won the Nobel prize in 1985. Their theory was that in a zero tax world, as you increase the debt, the cost of equity also rises, which means that you can't increase the value of the business by changing the capital structure. Mm -hmm. Now they later went on to revise that theory because they said that was in a world with no taxes in a world with taxes, increasing your debt would in fact lead the value of the firm to go up because you're getting those tax savings. So mm -hmm. in all these theories, there are going to be some assumptions that make it not all that 
reasonable. So for example, in the, I'm just going to call it MM, the, the last one. So that theory ignored the cost of bankruptcy, which could obviously be, be very real. They also ignore the cost of raising debt versus equity. And in general, the cost to raise equity is more. So just to give you some numbers here, fees on IPOs are usually in the six to 7% range. So that's mm -hmm. obviously quite high. Now raising debt is going to be much lower. So for fun, I looked at what Meta paid on their 2023 $10 billion bond issuance, and the fees range from 12 to 40 basis points. So I just like looked mm -hmm. at the prospectus, saw what the underwriting discount was, poof, I got the fees. So again, it can be starkly different. There's also the argument that debt adds discipline to a company. And look, the cost of debt doesn't typically rise linearly from what I saw it was usually more like a step function. So mm -hmm. like the cost is going to go up as you hit different tipping points. Mm -hmm. So obviously all these theories are like the academia of it all. And then there's reality. With that said, if you are talking about the whack and that theory, and then, yes, <laughs> if it holds true, right, it means that you can't create or destroy value by changing the capital structure. And this is sort of a more modern theory, if you will. And I, I personally always like that because it's like from my engineering background, it's like energy can't be created or destroyed. Or actually, sorry, <laughs> let me rephrase. You can't create it by just changing the capital structure until you mm -hmm. incorporate taxes. And, and the reason for this, if you're sitting there thinking, okay, well, why is that the case? It's really just a value transfer. It's from the taxpayers mm -hmm. to the company. So that's something just to be aware of. So now that we've talked debt, now let's talk about equity. The cost of equity represents not only dividends that investors get, but also capital appreciation. The way that it's often calculated in academia is you use something called CAPM or the capital asset pricing model, where you take the risk-free rate plus the levered beta times the market risk premium. And we've obviously talked about this in great detail. Another way that you theoretically could estimate it is using something called the dividend growth model, which basically takes your dividend per share over the market value of the equity times the growth rate. Again, this is not something I saw as much personally in the real world, but it is a theory mm -hmm. out there. What I did see, however, this is when I was working in converts, is we would have to create these cost of capital graphs all day when we would go and have meeting with the CFOs of companies who were interested in raising converts. And what we were trying to do was show the trade-offs between the cost of debt, the cost of equity, and then converts. Mm -hmm. And so what we would do is we would have these graphs. And on the y-axis of the graph, we would basically show what is the cost of capital. On the x-axis, we would show the compound annual growth rate, also called the CAGR, for the company over, say, like the next five years. Because mm -hmm. as you think about how expensive is your equity, well, it really depends on how that equity is going to grow with time. Mm -hmm. And so we would create these charts, and your cost of debt would be just like a straight line. Because uh -huh. a horizontal line rate right, has zero effect. The, the CAGR has no effect on it. The, the, right. the rate is what it is. Equity, on the other hand, was like perfectly correlated. And so you would had a 45 degree line, mm -hmm. a line with a slope of one. And then we would throw some converts on there where, again, your convert, it's going to look like debt before a certain Hager, and then it starts to look like equity. Below a certain premium, you've issued debt, and then you've sort of issued equity at a premium. The moral of that story, though, is that the cost of your capital is going to depend on what you think is going to happen to the share price or what does happen mm -hmm. to the share price. Companies get if they decided, I'm looking at this, I think my share price is going to be crappy. <laughs> well, maybe it's doing equity looks like a good move. Whereas uh -huh. like, if you think your equity is going to be hitting it out of the park in the next five years, well, you're going to want to obviously be issuing debt because it's a lot cheaper. Are you reaching for capital in a time of stress or in a time of strength? Yeah. Probably yeah. what influences that decision. Yeah. I mean, and then there's also the other added elements, what happens to your earnings per share. There can be different accounting treatments for some of these things. So that can also obviously play a role. Mm -hmm. But now I want to get into the part of discussion. So I said in the comments that we got, there was one that truly confused me. And I, I sent this to Jen because I got this comment that said, great video, but your assumptions are wrong. Right now, the cost of equity is lower than the cost of debt for investment grade companies. And to me, saying that is like saying the sky is not blue. I was mm -hmm. like literally confused. I sent this to Jen. I'm like, I don't even know how to reply to this because I feel like we're talking two different languages. So the reason for this is debt is more senior in the capital structure. What that means is that debt holders are going to get paid their interest before any dividends are paid to equity holders. They also were first in line in recovery in a bankruptcy. Bed Bath & Beyond went bankrupt earlier this year. The equity holders likely got more or less wiped out. Lenders can expect anywhere up to 70, 80, 90% recovery. Yeah, so there can be great recovery. There can be great recovery. Actually, average uh, recovery for a first lien loan is like 76%. Mm -hmm. Average recovery for a bond is like 40%. Um, that's, by the way, from Fitch's bankruptcy database. 
So it does mean that if you are a company going bankrupt, the lenders are going to get money back. It's less risky for them. They're not going to demand as high a return as an equity investor. Mm -hmm. Just to say like off the bat, I was like, well, this doesn't sound right. So I was trying to understand where he was coming from. And he said, well, the way that we calculate the cost of equity is we take the earnings per share over the share price. For those of you not familiar, that is the inverse of something called the P.E. ratio, which we've talked about before. We talked about on our valuation fundamentals. Episode, exactly. Two or three so episodes ago. It's essentially looking at how much is an investor paying for $1 of expected earnings in the company. Mm -hmm. Again, I was trying to figure out, like, is this in some way related to, like, the dividend growth model, but it ignores the dividend pay ratio, it ignores the growth rate, and it's, again, it's not really the cost of equity. So I think what this person was trying to say, or I think what the analysis was, I could be wrong, but this is how, in theory, I have seen this sort of analysis used, is you can look at something called relative PEs, mm -hmm. and this is very common in the mergers and acquisition space. And so it's, it's oftentimes more used if you have a company buying another company, you can look at the relative PEs of where the company stocks trade and say, oh, okay, this deal is going to be accretive to earnings per share, right? Because EPS is often used as a proxy for what's going to happen to the share price. EPS goes up, the share price goes up, EPS goes mm -hmm. down, the share price goes down. If a deal is accretive and it means that EPS is going up, it means that in theory, you expect the share price to go up. So you actually can do that, funny enough, using both the PE of equity, which is what we've all gotten used to. And then there's also this concept called PE of cash or PE of debt, where you basically take one over the after-tax cost of debt. And so it almost seems like what this guy is doing is instead of taking the PE, taking one over the PE and saying, which of those costs is higher? So putting some numbers around this, okay, let's pretend back to our prior example. You have a company with a cost of debt of 7% and a 25% tax rate, right? We've already established that gets you a five and a quarter after-tax cost of debt. Mm -hmm. Now, pretend that company's equity is trading at 20 times, okay? Well, if I take one over that, one over 20 is 5%, and I compare it to five and a quarter, well, that means that if I issue equity, it's going to be less dilutive to my earnings per share than, than issuing debt would be. Mm -hmm. So if all I cared about is what happens to my earnings per share, then yeah, I mean, using that as a back of the envelope calculation to understand which is going to be more accretive or dilutive to my earnings per share, you could use that. Now, that's the only thing that I was able to come up with. And, and by the way, if you were doing a deal, you oftentimes might say, should I be issuing debt or equity? Again, looking at the PE of cash versus the PE of your stock. But the thing is, is that that's not actually a cost of equity. It's literally just seeing how does it affect your earnings per share. And the, the decision that a company makes on the financing in that case is different than the valuation analysis that they might do. Like you that you're using run, the WAC for that you're using the WAC for that exactly these formulas are yeah, yeah, yeah. going into. Exactly. So we were kind of starting talking about just the WAC in general, the theory that lowering your WAC is going to increase the valuation of the business. Mm -hmm. Earnings per share is a different metric. It mm -hmm. is not a business metric. The EPS is the value of the company's equity over the number of shares. It is an equity value. And it also has accounting thrown in there. It's just a different analysis. So I don't know. Hopefully that was helpful. And I wanted to just address that question because it, I thought, brought up some kind of interesting points that we were able to get to. 